I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, February 5th. Storm Surf. Waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You'll get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. All right, let's get to work. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights from the North Pacific Ocean. We see remnants of a gale off of Cape Mendocino still producing 18-foot seas with energy from that system pushing towards the California coast. Another gale producing 24-foot seas in the Gulf of Alaska aimed pretty well off to the east. And remnants from another system previously off the Kuril Islands generating 22-foot seas over the Dateline pushing off to the east as well. So, three swells in the water. Three aimed at the U.S. West Coast, two with potential for Hawaii, and swell appears to finally be on the way. Doing a quick look at uh, wave heights up and down the California coast. We'll start up in Northern California, Half Moon Bay, buoy 46012. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy all the way up to 30.3 second period, real long period energy, which there isn't any. But we see a bump of swell here in about the 13 second period range and a whole bunch of wind swell. This chart goes the whole way down to five second periods. That's pure wind chop, not even really surfable. Surfable, surf, uh, rideable surf starts. Some around six seconds and then goes up in energy and quality from there. Looking at what we see on the graph here, putting that all together, primary swell 5.8 feet at 12.2 seconds from 297 degrees. That roughly equates to surf about two feet overhead with a bunch of wind swell in the mix, 6.3 feet at 9.1 seconds. Uh, producing almost six foot surf. So the, the wind swell and the gr semi ground swell are almost the same size. Doing the same thing in the northern part of Southern California, buoy 46053, East Santa Barbara buoy. We look, we see very little swell, tiny little bit of energy in the, uh, 13, 14 second period range and a bunch of wind swell in the mix there too. Putting that all together, 3.3 feet at 5.9 seconds from 268 degrees. That's about two foot. And then some secondary swell at 1.9 feet at 10 seconds. So pretty uh, lackluster pattern there. Going to the south end of Southern California, buoy 191 point Loma South buoy. Again, looking, we see a little bump of energy in about the 14 second period range and a bunch of wind swell there. That all comes out to 2.1 feet at 12.7 seconds from 232 degrees. That's surf about, you know, thigh high, something like that. That's actually some, uh, little southern, lingering southern hemi swell from a rare little gale that popped up, uh, southeast of New Zealand over a week ago. Uh, that swell is way past its peak and the last little bits of it are fading out now. And then going over to Hawaii, North Shore of Oahu, Waimea Bay, buoy 106. We see, again, the same sort of wind swell pattern, most energy in the eight or nine second period and real no, no real ground swell. Primary swell, 4.7 feet at 8.4 seconds from 46 degrees. That's northeast wind swell. Surf about four feet. And yeah, that's about what it is. Maybe head high on the bigger sets. And really just not a whole lot going on either on the mainland or in the islands. But hopefully that's to change really soon. So we're going to go back in time to Thursday. This was the uh, the 2nd of February. We see a little gale here that developed off the Creel Islands with 30-foot seas. It built to about, oh, 32.8 feet, something like that. This is the highest seas over this entire domain. Get the actual coordinates, max wind, wind speeds, and typically the wind speeds in the seas sync up 48.4 knots, roughly right over there. And then that pushed east, slowly faded, and still the lingering energy from it is on the dateline as of Sunday. Now we're actually going to go, let's go back a little bit here again. Another little gale flared up on Saturday off of, we'll say Oregon, with 20-foot seas aimed off to the southeast and didn't really do a whole lot more than that. And here we are Sunday, you see the remnants of that gale off the coast, swell pushing into California, swell from the Kuril Island system pushing towards Hawaii, and then we'll go back just a little bit more 
on Saturday. Another tiny gale flared up north of Hawaii with 22 to 23 foot seas, maybe a little bit more than that on Sunday. And swell doubling with the Kuril swell bound in for the Hawaiian Islands early in the work week. So surf wise things have been pretty quiet for the past couple of days, but hopefully as we get into the new work week, a building swell pattern, nothing huge, but certainly rideable surf for most places is expected. Now let's go look into the future. Right now, on Sunday, we're looking at jet stream. These winds up are up about 30,000 feet, help support the formation of gales. When they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet, like right there. And what that helps create is a counterclockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. And of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds, as they get traction on the ocean surface, generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, eventually turn into swell. Swell, when hits your beach, turns into surf. So we have a little trough. It's mainly a weather producer for California, and we'll get into that in a minute, certainly for the Sierra. Um, but otherwise, we do have a consolidated jet stream flow pushing the whole way to the point north of Hawaii. That's normally pretty good. That's a sign of some energy in the jet, but no real clear troughs uh, indicated at the moment. As we get into Monday, a bit of a trough starts digging out over the date line. That's offering some potential. Wind energy is not particularly strong in the jet, but maybe we'll get a gale out of that. Notice a little weather producer, another trough off of British Columbia on Tuesday. Maybe that'll make some weather there. Certainly, a gale is likely in this trough as we get into Wednesday. Notice the jet, though, starting to unzip a little bit here to a point almost at the date line. Uh, most of the wind energy off of Japan making it to the date line and kind of falling apart. Anyway, this trough continues off to the east into Thursday. Another, another trough digs out uh, off the Krill Islands on Friday, pushes off to the east. The jet trying to build still pretty much the split point. We'll say 170 west, a little bit east of the date line. And we're 150 hours out. Notice this split, very split jet stream flow. That typically makes for strong high pressure between the two uh, branches of the jet with a trough pushing onshore to California, probably a big gradient between what is likely high pressure here and low pressure here. And that would probably make some sort of a wind, wind event as we get into next weekend, if you believe the models. Then another bit of a trough tries to dig out over the date line on Monday, but also a little bit of a split here. So we're not quite sure how this is all going to play out. But for now, it looks like split jet in the east, consolidated jet, jet in the west, and just waiting for a boost of energy to hit the jet. So let's take a look down at the ocean surface. Surface level pressure, surface level winds, 1032 millibar high pressure system off California. Uh, low pressure in the Gulf of Alaska, a fetch of 40 knot winds generating some seas here. Another remnant fetch of 30 knot winds off the Kuril Islands on the Dateline generating some fetch and, and some seas as we saw earlier. But all that pretty much fades out as we get into Monday. Another gale is forecast in a developing trough on Tuesday. 40 knot winds aim pretty well at the Hawaiian Islands building to 45 if not 50 knots for a brief moment of time. Aim pretty well to the south, so maybe some swell from that for Hawaii. And this system continues working its way off to the east as getting into Wednesday with 40 to 45 knot northwest winds targeting the U.S. west coast. Another gale starts developing as we get into Wednesday night and Thursday with 45 knot winds. Now this system was theoretically uh, a couple of days ago forecast to be incredibly strong strong and then even this morning's run of the model showed it being pretty strong but now looking much weaker with only 30 to 35 knot winds so we get into friday and fading out another gale building behind that on the dateline with 45 knot winds pushing off to the east and yet another gale forecast behind that as we get into sunday with 55 knot north winds and possibly getting traction but the model has way overhyped everything out in this region and by the time they actually form it tends to be something less than that so we're not going to get too optimistic yet about this we do see high pressure we do see strong trades pushing into the hawaiian islands and down the u.s west coast that probably is more likely a reality Let's go take it the the effect of those winds on the ocean surface in t terms of generating seas. 
The two lows we were looking at as we get into Monday both start fading out. The, the first one here impacting uh, British Columbia and pretty much gone. As we get into Tuesday, new gale, 28-foot seas, targeting the Hawaiian Islands a little bit, and then pulsing again as we get into Wednesday, the 9th of February, targeting the U.S. West Coast pretty good, continuing even as we get into Friday. Another gale, we're going to actually go back here just a little bit. Another gale develops over the Dateline region, we'll say on Thursday, generating... 26 to 28 foot seas this one was supposed to at one point have 54 foot seas now it's pretty much just a standard wintertime gale producing you know 25 to 30 foot seas as we get into saturday yet another system over the date line with 32 foot seas and then fading and then our next system queued up behind that so a progressive series of storms with Better seas than what we've had right now. I mean, we're pretty much at nothing, so anything's a plus. But no whole-scale, large, mega, swell-producing systems. But a steady dribble of, uh, we'll call it moderate-sized surf for both Hawaii. Hawaii probably a little bit bigger from some of these in the west. And the U.S. west coast a little bit bigger for those that were in the Gulf. Wind forecast for the U.S. West Coast in Hawaii, right down there. High pressure in control, generating northwest winds along the U.S. West Coast. Pretty much a choppy, blown-out mess north of Point Conception, even into Southern California today. Hawaii, very strong trades, or at least solid trades were in effect. So we get into Monday, more of the same. Now, this actually looks a little bit worse than it is. If you look at some of the close nearshore models, wind pattern looks a lot nicer earlier early in the morning on Monday, and I think Tuesday and Wednesday as well. But with 20-knot uh, plus winds over outer waters, whatever swell there will be, there will be some bump generated from this or lump mixed in. Trades for the Hawaiian Islands, about 15, maybe pushing 20 knots. Tuesday, maybe the winds lighten up a bit along the California coast. Trades still pretty solid for the uh, Hawaiian Islands. Wednesday, still this north persistent pesky northwest wind pattern. Near shore, lighter winds. Hawaiian Islands, 20 knot trades in control. It's almost like it's springtime. And as we get into Thursday, look at this, 20, 25 knots. Lighter wind regime for the U.S. West Coast with a front off the coast. This high pressure is going to be the thing to watch for, though. As we get into Friday, once low pressure clears out of California, high pressure builds in strong. The wind machine kicks up why just getting pounded by east trades at 25 knots saturday california feels the brunt of that with 30 knot winds yeah Local winds, well, if you got some protected breaks, you get something rideable. Trades continue for the Hawaiian Islands. As we get into Sunday, the 12th of February, winds finally start to lighten up for California. Trade's still pretty solid for the Hawaiian Islands. Almost looks like spring, but it isn't. Nowhere close. And even as we get into Monday, more of the same. Precipitation forecast, yes, it's snowing in the Sierra. There's lingering showers in north and maybe down into some parts of central California. But while as we get into Monday, high pressure takes over. Nary a drop of precipitation forecast. Maybe kept Cape Mendocino to get a little bit on Tuesday night at best. And then we're continuing in. Where are we here on Friday? A little bit for Cape Mendocino, light precipitation. Maybe some snow, very light snow working its way down the Sierra Friday night into maybe early Saturday morning. Bulletproof high pressure sets up at 1038 millibars, driving the wind machine and draw, driving a dry air pattern as we get through the week. So no real significant snow or rain expected for California. The snow forecast dashboard for Olympic Valley, well, a little bit of snow still lingering t uh, today. It's actually wrapping up there now. Total accumulation was about four inches, something like that, maybe a dot or two on, the, on Valentine's Day. Kirkwood pretty much in the same position for the next 10 days. And Mammoth with maybe an inch or two, and that's it. So a pretty dry pattern in effect right now. Snow level for Olympic Valley. This is the base of, uh, of Olympic Valley at about 6,200 feet. The summit up about 9,000 feet. Uh, the red is liquid precipitation. The gray is sleet. The white is actual snow. And the blue is more copious amounts of snow due to colder temperatures. The freezing line is right between the gray and the white line. So right at about 4,000 feet tonight. 
forecast falling to maybe 1,500 feet. But then as we get into the six uh, temperatures, warming almost above freezing almost to the summit or at least to 8,200 feet, something like that, continuing through the 8th and the 9th, Following then again on the 10th and the 11th, back up on the 12th and the 13th, and then colder Valentine's Day and a little bit beyond that. But without any significant precipitation, what does it matter? All right. Well, none of that is particularly optimistic, at least in the snow and the rain uh, uh, angle of things. But if you look at the long-term outlook, specifically at the MJO and then later on the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, things are looking a bit better. So let's dive into that. So the first part of this discussion will be about the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, a periodic weather oscillation that rotates around the planet. It has two phases, active and inactive phase. The active phase is on one side of the planet, the inactive phase on the other. They rotate west to east around the equator. So at some point in time, the in like, like right now, we suspect the inactive phase is pushing over the Pacific. And what does that do? Well, the inactive phase is like a high pressure system. It steals energy from the jet stream, making it split, just like what we're seeing right now on the charts. And it also, because it's high pressure, it tends to increase trades or uh, support a stronger trade, trade wind flow, which then uh, helps create upwelling in cooler temperatures on the ocean surface. That doesn't feed any energy to the jet stream and does nothing to support us long term in terms of surf production. But when the active phase moves over the Pacific, the exact opposite happens. The active phase is like a low pressure system. When it pushes over the far west Pacific, it dampens trade winds. It also creates lifting air, which imparts energy to the jet stream, making it stronger, helping to heal that split jet stream flow make and making the jet more energetic so it does better at uh, helping to create eddies in, in the jet stream. Uh, which in turn creates storms, which in turn creates surf and wind, and also pushes low pressure systems into California, creating precipitation and snow. So the active phase is good phase, inactive phase, what we call the bad phase. All right, so we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. Right now, this is uh, data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator. This is the East Pacific here, the West Pacific here, the equator right there. Dateline right there, New Guinea right there. We're just looking at the arrows. The arrows tell us the wind speed and wind direction. The longer the arrows, the stronger the wind. So pretty strong trades over the East Pacific, pretty strong trades over the Central Pacific, pretty strong trades over the West Pacific, what we call the Kelvin wave generation area. Now, when we say the active phase of the MJO, when it pushes over the West Pacific, not only does it help dampen trade winds, but that can, that process in turn can take warm water that's in the West Pacific, start it to slosh off to the east driven by Coriolis forces. That warm water doesn't go on the surface. It follows the thermocline under the equator across the Pacific. Three months later, starts gurgling up magically off of Ecuador. If you have successive active phases of the MJO, they create successive Kelvin waves, which can start warming water temperatures rapidly in the East Pacific. And that in turn then starts feeding the jet stream and can help usher in El Nino. All right, but it's not the actual wind speeds that matter. It's the anomalies, the difference from normal for this time of year. Yeah, trades are pretty strong from the east and the east Pacific, but looking at these little arrows here, they're not, it's only the east or west motion of the wind that we care about because that's what helps create Kelvin waves and drives water direction in this area. Pretty much normal there. Central Pacific, yeah, trades a little bit stronger out of the east than normal, but not too bad. And even over the Kelvin wave generation area, the west Pacific, yeah, trades stronger than normal, but not horribly bad. But this all sort of suggests the inactive phase of the MJO is in control right now. The one part I forgot to mention is it takes about anywhere from four to six weeks from the for either phase of the MJO to traverse the Pacific, from the West Pacific to the East Pacific. So if you've ever noticed when we have surf, it sort of comes in batches and in like a month-long window, just like the rain window we had around Christmas into mid-January, that was the active phase of the MJO in control. It pumped a bunch of energy in the jet stream. The jet stream got consolidated, took all the warm water and moist air over in the West Pacific, slammed it right into California, and we got inundated. We 
had piles of surf too, but there was so much wind it was hardly rideable, at least north of Point Conception. So now we're in the opposite phase, the inactive phase and controlled trades are nuking, a lot of wind going on in the other direction. And so we'll see how much longer that's going to last. Just to drive the point home, we're looking at 850 millibar wind anomalies. That's the east-west component of the wind again. That's up about 4,700 feet, but a pretty good average for what's going on at the surface. This is just the past five days. South America there, Central America there, Hawaii up there, the equator, zero right there, Dateline right there, New Guinea there, the Kelvin wave generation right area, this area right here on the equator, five degrees north and south of the equator from about 125 west out to about 170, I'm sorry, 125 east to 170 west. So you just draw a box in your mind right there. This is where we want west anomalies to create Kelvin waves. And if we have Kelvin waves, we have enough of them that can bring us El Nino. And of course, that brings us all the good stuff that we're all here looking for. All right. But right now we're looking at the blues and these easterly areas suggesting stronger than normal trades, suggesting the inactive phase of the MJO. That was January 30th, 31st, same deal. If anything, getting stronger on the 1st, the 2nd, and the 3rd. But also notice westerly anomalies building in the Indian Ocean and then over the maritime continent here starting about February 1st and building more, suggesting this is the building active phase of the MJO. So notice, easterly winds blowing right about to this line right here, westerly anomalies here, and these easterly anomalies will slide off to the east, and the westerly anomalies at some point will slide into the West Pacific if the stars are aligned correctly. All right, so what's the forecast for the next week? This is the whole planet on one chart, strange looking chart. All it's showing is, is the wind blowing stronger out of the east or stronger out of the west than normal. Now we gotta get ourselves oriented because this is not the Pacific. The dateline runs right up the middle. The far uh, west Pacific starts about 125 east, so right about there. Kelvin wave generation area, that's what we're mainly interested. In. That's what drives everything. So it's from the far west Pacific to about the dateline, so right there. And this is the forecast down here. You can look here in the past. You see, oh, and the oranges and yellow, westerly anomalies. The blues, easterly anomalies. Notice this just persistent easterly anomaly pattern right on the dateline. But notice it kind of wavers. It was over the dateline. It moved west towards the far west Pacific today, pretty much filling it. And then notice it's supposed to start tracking off to the east. So this is the classic uh, La Nina signal. Easterly anomalies just filling the dateline for months and months on ends with westerly anomalies over the maritime continent. Now, when you get into El Nino, it sort of flips. The easterly anomalies are over here. The westerly anomalies are over the dateline. That's what we want to see. And that's what we're hoping we're moving towards. All right, so the forecast for the next seven days, well, westerly anomalies, you can see just the leading edge of it slowly working its way off to the east, filling half the Kelvin wave generation area. Kelvin wave generation area goes from here to about here. So filling about half of it at the end of the coming week, but with very strong easterly anomalies, the last stand of the inactive phase of the MJO and a strong one at that, just trying to hang on on the dateline. But by about February 10th, it starts losing its mojo as westerly anomalies build in. Let's go look a little bit further out. Outgoing long wave radiation forecast, just another word for cloud cover. Remember, if the active phase of the MJO is like a low pressure system, it has clouds with it. The inactive phase is like a high pressure system. It has no clouds, clear skies. So this chart is showing that. The oranges and reds showing more sunlight bouncing off the ocean surface. Uh, the inactive phase of the MJO, the blues, more cloud cover, less sunlight reflecting off the ocean surface. So uh, the active phase of the MJO. And let's get ourselves oriented. South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea there, Dateline right there, Equator, EQ going right across there. Kelvin wave generation area right in there. That's where we're interested. Inactive phase of the MJO today. Inactive phase of the MJO five days from now. 
but notice the active phase trying to bleed into the west pacific same deal active phase trying to make a little more headway as the inactive phase fades 10 days from now and 15 days from now the active phase in control of the kelvin wave generation area exactly what we want to see now this is the statistic model the dynamic model pretty much showing the exact same thing. If anything, the active phase stronger two weeks from now than the inactive phase. And maybe we can just get a little glimpse here of the difference between the two models. There's the statistic model, the last frame, and the dynamic model right there. Yes, definitely active phase a little bit stronger than what the uh, statistic model suggests. We'll take it. Phase diagrams for the two models, statistic model, dynamic model here. Uh, how do you read this? Well, the MJO moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent to the West Pacific to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. It just goes round and round and round. The active phase is where the heavy dot is right here. So in the far east Indian Ocean, the track here is the 15-day forecast of where the active phase is going to be. Now, remember, if the active phase is here, the inactive phase is probably on the other side of the planet, so roughly in the East Pacific. The further the dot is away from this circle, the stronger the active phase is. So a modestly strong active phase forecast making it to, we'll say, the far west Pacific, the very entry to it two weeks from now, and exceedingly weak. The dynamic model pretty much saying the same thing, only having the active phase move into the east Pacific in two weeks and exceedingly weak. We really want to see the active phase, like, up here, strong, far away from the circle in the west Pacific, but doesn't look like that's going to happen, at least not immediately. All right, let's go out a month. This is the CFS model. Again, 850 millibar winds. The blues, easterly anomalies. The reds and, reds and oranges, westerly anomalies. Now, this model overlays the MJO itself, the solid contour, the active phase of the MJO. And this is back in December. So, active phase of the MJO. And, oh, and Kelvin wave generation area starts right here, 125 west to about 170 west there. So you see the persistent easterly anomaly La Nina wind pattern. But in December, west anomalies, the reds, made it. They bulged out, filling about half the Kelvin wave generation area. And you saw the response we got from that, strong jet stream piles of rain, flooding, all that kind of stuff. The dotted contour is the inactive phase of the MJO. Notice the reds retreating off to the west, the blues filling the Kelvin wave generation area. Here we are today, the inactive phase of the MJO making its push across the Pacific with our patch of very strong easterly anomalies forecast for the next week. And then after that, pretty much gone. Notice a much weaker easterly wind pattern compared to anything that's happened the past month and actually the past year much weaker after that also notice a very strong the strongest active phase of the mj we've seen in quite a while forecast with equal as equally strong as those east anomalies are westerly anomalies equally strong in the kelvin wave generation area reaching to probably two-thirds of the way across the kelvin wave generation area we'll say Oh, not, uh, we'll say Wednesday, a week from now, something like that. And the active phase of the MJO itself pushing the whole way across. Well, California is at, the coast is at 122. Now, this is on the equator, but the whole way south of California. And last week, remember, we talked about February 19th being a magic date. It almost looks like, based on this model, that might be a little bit late in the game, and magic might start even happening by about the 14th of February. We'll see. The models aren't quite out there yet. But somewhere around this time frame, we would expect energy to start being imported to the jet, the jet starting to starting to rage, uh, not being split, at least making it two-thirds of the way across the Pacific, increased potential for storm development, maybe rainfall for California. But again, it's a way out. We're just looking here based purely on the MJOs. So uh, don't take it to the bank. But if there was ever a big uh, bullseye you want to put for swell production, this window between, we'll say, February 11th and somewhere around the end of February 
seems possible. Now remember, it takes four weeks for the MJO to make it across the Pacific from February 4th to, yeah, right about March 4th, something like that. So we'll see if that plays out. And yet one more model. This is the same CFS model, but it goes out three months. The forecast is the top. Past performance is the bottom. So you see here the oranges and reds are the westerly anomalies, the active phase, the MJO. The blues, the inactive phase. The big thing to notice, look at how strong those easterly anomalies are over the next week from the 5th through the 13th. But also notice they're just barely in the Kelvin wave generation area. So maybe that won't have too much of a negative impact. It's really westerly or easterly anomalies over in this area between 120 and 180, and we're pretty much out of there. So, and also notice westerly anomalies building steadily over the Pacific, the whole way to a point south of California as we get into April and May, though we're pretty much done with the winter season in terms of surfing, but suggesting a long-term significant change in weather for the Pacific. Please let it be so. Now also notice our previous uh, active phase of the MJO in December and January here, reaching to about this point here. This next active phase looking equally as good with equal strength, at least one pocket of good strong winds. This had pretty good pocket here right around Christmas time. We'll see if this actually develops. They're about in the, actually this one's further west than this ever was, so that could do a lot for Kelvin wave production. All right, so anyway, just eyeballing this active phase of the MJO looks possible here. And then certainly something up here, but I don't believe a model three months out, but certainly looks promising. Let's overlay the MJO. All right, so inactive phase of the MJO, our current inactive phase, pretty much out of the picture here as we get not quite to next week's video, but something like that. With the active phase pushing in into the West Pacific, taking control the whole way through about we'll say mid-March. After that, a very lackluster MJO pattern with no real uh, active or inactive phase, but West Anomalies forecast just taking control of the Pacific. That suggests a major change. Low-pass filter. This is the real key here. Okay, so did you see that? I'll just do it again. It's this dotted contour and this solid contour here. The dotted contour, high pressure bias. Consider this the La Nina signal. It's been locked over the dateline since the beginning of time, or at least the past two plus years. Notice as we get into March, east of the low pressure, the high pressure bias, pretty much moving east of the Kelvin wave generation area first week in March, at least the, the secondary contour. The primary contour, out of the Kelvin wave generation area by the first part of April. Also notice the low pressure bias here, the El Nino indicator, making major shifts off to the east starting, well, even starting a week from now. The leading edge of this just steadily marching off to the east, and by the end of the model, filling the entirety of the Kelvin wave generation area with dragging the westerly anomalies with it, setting up a long-term pattern change that is very much due for the Pacific. All right, so what's going on in the ocean? This is sea surface temperatures at depth down in the ocean, the West Pacific here, East Pacific here. These are anchor lines on the TAO buoys strung across the equator. The X's are the actual sensors on those anchor lines, temperature sensors. They gather sea, sea subsurface temperature data in centigrade, and then we use a model to go, or actually NOAA uses a model, to go and interpolate the temperatures in between the sensors to get a profile of what the subsurface temperatures are doing. In essence, what they're looking for is Kelvin waves pushing across the Pacific. So from this, we can look 28 degree isotherm right here. That's 28 degrees centigrade. That's pretty warm. About where it was last week, oh, 175, 174 east, something like that. 26 ice, uh, degree isotherm at about 159, 158 west. Pretty much unchanged. 24 degree isotherm uh, holding the whole across the Pacific pretty deep. Uh, 
No Kelvin wave indicated here, no significant movement of warm water, but not cold water filling this area. But again, this is just the actual temperatures. It is the anomalies, difference from normal for this time of year. And then you get the sense of what's really going on. We see much warmer than normal, four degrees centigrade. That's seven degrees Fahrenheit, roughly. Now pushing last week there at, well, where are we here? Let's see. 130 is there, so that's 130. So about 135 west. I think last week it was at 140 west, suggesting warm water pushing off to the east. Also, last week, this cool pool was blocking. There was no stream working into the East Pacific. Now this suggests a steady stream of warm water pushing across the Pacific. The upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle uh, this is a previous Kelvin wave generated from the Christmas active phase of the MJO. It's made its... No, no, actually, sorry. This is a previous Kelvin wave before that. This is the Kelvin wave being generated from the Christmas active phase of the MJO, pushing its way across the Pacific. It's still probably got another month and a half or so to go before it impacts Ecuador. But keep that in mind because significant things are happening already. So... One Kelvin wave has impacted uh, back a couple months ago. Another Kelvin wave in flight, probably due to impact, uh, just eyeballing this, I'm guessing sometime in early March, something like that. And another strong active phase of the MJO is forecast in the next week. Now here's another view of the same thing, West Pacific here, East Pacific here. The way this guy goes and gets his data is not at all from the TAO buoy array. Most of it's from satellite-based data. Now we're looking down in the ocean, so how can you use a satellite to determine what's going on under the ocean? We'll get into that in a minute. But the point being, the leading tip of this Kelvin wave at about 130, 30 west. Now it still shows the cool pool stuck between the previous Kelvin wave and this new Kelvin wave, but this is also runs about a week behind the satellites. Take more, they take uh, a week to, uh, I think it's almost a week to do a complete orbit and cover every square inch of the ocean surface. So there is this lag there, whereas the data up here is by sensors that you can grab data from like every hour or a couple times a day. I don't know what the actual, how often they read. So this lags about a week behind, but we guess, we bet when the next version of this guy pops up uh, in a couple of days, this cool pool, a lot of it will be gone. And this is the source for that previous chart, sea level anomaly data, satellite data, just showing you the height of the ocean. Now, it's not like wave heights or anything. They actually strip out all the wave heights, they strip out the tides, they strip out the wind waves, and just is the sphere of the ocean higher or lower than normal? And why would it be higher or lower than normal? Well, cold water at depth contracts and when it contracts when it's over a you know a thousand square miles and it contracts because it's colder you'll end up with a divot on the ocean surface and if it expands because it's hotter than normal you'll get a bump on the ocean surface and you can see that pretty plainly in this image here's the equator here's the date line south america down here central america hawaii right there new guinea right there we see Positive anomalies, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 centimeters above normal. That's, you know, that much, something like that. But the satellite can sense that, and it's pretty accurate, suggesting piles of warm water here in the West Pacific being driven by two years of nuking high pressure and, and above normal easterly trades blowing any hint of warm water in the East Pacific off to the West, and it just sits here and just festers and piles up. Okay. Also notice cooler than normal or lower than normal anomalies here in the East Pacific, but not nearly as bad as they've been over the past two years. In fact, all that's left is this one little pocket right here, minus five centimeters. And we think that is that little pocket, the upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle that we saw on the previous chart right there. So see that? That's uh, Where's that? It's about at 120, 115 west with warm there and warm there. And so there it is right there, 115 west with warm off here and a little bit of warm there, Galapagos right there. We think this guy about a week from now was going to be all but gone or nearly gone. And you're just slowly going to watch these warm anomalies at 
150. Actually, we think they're about 130. Leading edge right here. See this starting to push off to the east. Kelvin wave approaching from the December active phase of the MJO. And this chart shows it even better. All right, West Pacific here, East Pacific here, upper ocean heat anomalies. This is the upper 300 meters of the ocean. That's all that really matters. Kelvin waves, they dive down following the thermocline. They go down about 150 meters as they traverse the Pacific. Like this one back here, you see warm water going from west to east. This was back almost a year ago. Upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle enhanced by La Nina, a bunch of cool water. Another Kelvin wave back in the May, actually it was two Kelvin waves, but they were both very weak, could barely make it across the Pacific. They tried massive upwelling response. So this is again the uh, during La Nina, the inactive phase of the MJO, the upwelling response is stronger than the active phases, the Kelvin waves, and you can see it pretty clearly. Kelvin wave, much larger uh, upwelling phase. Kelvin wave, much larger upwelling phase. Kelvin wave, uh, back in December, the first in the series, and then a little upwelling response, but not that strong. And then we had our active phase in December, January. Look at all the warm water pushing off to about 145 west right now. Uh, we'll see how this plays out, but we're looking at one, two, and with the eight, another active phase of the MJO forecast a week from now, possibly three Kelvin waves in flight. What do you think that's going to do? All right, so let's go take a look at the ocean surface. What's going on? Not actual temperatures, sea surface temperature anomalies, the difference from normal for this time of year. And a clear trend is developing here. South America, uh, let's see, Peru. Ecuador right there, the Galapagos, Central America, Hawaii there. Notice warm water building out to 120 west over the Galapagos and Ecuador. Same sort of frame here. And then warmer than normal water all off of Chile and Peru. And then over the South Pacific. Now, the only thing that really matters is 5 degrees north and south of the equator. But the point being here is this colder water was down to 20, if not 25 south a month ago. It's getting squeezed out. The depth or the intensity of the cool temperatures here, as we've talked about last week, getting steadily lighter. And even here where the darkest of the cools are, not as cool as they were anymore. The trend for the past seven days, sea surface temperature trend, warming, warming, warming. This whole area has been like this since November 14th, with nary a cold upwelling event since somewhere in mid-December, something like that. And the beat just goes on. It keeps staying warm. We think these warming temperatures here are from the previous Kelvin wave still working its way till the, to, to the surface. And that, along with just lighter than normal trades in some of this area, uh, ha allowing the sun to cook the ocean surface and raising temperatures. And then the backed off view here, pretty much the same thing. Warm, 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 building warm along here. And the cool water, yes, it's lingering, but not nearly as cold. Here's the sea surface temperature trend for the past, uh, past 30 days, I believe it is. So this will wrap around. Here we go. We'll start January 6th. You can see warming temperatures, steadily warming building, backing off, and now warming yet again as we get into February. So a steadily warming pattern. And in terms of cooling, here we go, a couple little pockets there, but not really any significant cooling for the past month. This is exactly where we want to be. And we can graph this out. Sea surface temperature uh, anomalies in the Nino 1.2 region. That's the area right there along the Galapagos and Ecuador. Uh, you can see since November, early part of November, a steadily down at minus 2 degrees below normal. Today, up at 758 thousandths of a degree above normal, almost 1 degree above normal, and steadily going upwards. This is what you'd want to see. Now, you look at the same data for the Nino 3.4 region. This is the official El Nino monitoring region, the area on the equator from south of California out to about the dateline. It doesn't look good at all. 
It shows temperatures still 948 thousandths of a degree below normal. The uh, normal threshold, you know, when you're in normal territory is half a degree below normal to half a degree above normal. And if you're above half a degree, you're in El Nino territory. Now, this is showing that we're going nowhere. But if you look at data, other data from NOAA, and I think there's something going on a little bit hokey with that, that one index, this shows Nino 3.4 temperatures. Now, it's not a daily thing like what we're looking there, but there's 0.6 of a degree below normal. So maybe 0.65 of a degree below normal and rising steadily since uh, I believe that's December 1st or 2nd, something like that. This seems more believable based on all the data we're looking at. Nino 4, which is even further in the West Pacific, also up at 0.6 of a degree. You can see the trend on all the indexes are heading steadily upward. So we believe something's hokey with that data that we were looking at on the previous chart. So what's the atmosphere think is doing is going on? Remember, the atmosphere sits above the ocean. If the ocean's colder than normal, that tends to support high pressure and the uh, inactive phase of the MJO or La Nina. If uh, sea surface temperatures are warming, you get more evaporation, lifting air. That tends to lower pressure, and then you get more into a active phase or El Nino-type pattern. So we look at the SOI uh, index, the difference in pressure between Darwin, which is in the Indian Ocean, and Tahiti, which is in the Pacific. Uh, when pressure is lower in Tahiti, the index goes negative. Uh, today, it's certainly not doing that, plus 16.57. And it has been more or less pretty positive uh, 24 a month ago. Now, you see it did dip out a bit here in January, started rising some the later part of January. It's, it's showing more signs of weakness than it has in the past, but not significant weakness. The so 30-day average, 10.17. We go back a month from now. Well, 20.92. So actually, it's heading down. That's a good sign. The 90-day, so this would be the uh, inactive active phase of the MJO. Now, it also lags a bit by 30 days. So this is probably, a lot of this is picking up on the active phase of the MJO that hit back in December and the early part of January. The 90-day average, the El Nino La Nina indicator, 1309, that's positive. Where were we a month ago? 14. So pretty much unchanged, suggesting steady state La Nina conditions, at least for the moment. Here is the data graphed out. You can see this goes back, uh, what, about two years, something like that. The downward spikes are the active phase of the MJO. The upward spikes are the inactive phase. When the inactive phase is creates more is stronger than the active phase, you get this average line that's going upward or a La Nina signal. Now notice, it seems like we've been pretty steady state since July. We're in the middle of a downward spike. We want to see this. This is probably going to go up for about another week, but then we suspect it's going to start plummeting after that. We're hoping so. The zero point is down here. That's just neutral. And you got to be below zero to get in an El Nino bias kind of pattern. So we still have quite a ways to go. The ocean still and the atmosphere above it still thinking we're in La Nina. But clearly there are signs that something is trying to change. Perhaps we've reached the ultimate imbalance point and an atmospheric correction is going to come. And that gets us to the really interesting part of the discussion. Sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3.4 region, the official El Nino monitoring region. The trend, you can see it here, all right, half a degree, between half a degree below normal and half a degree above is neutral. There's dead neutral right there. Where are we? We're about in February, uh, early part of February, right in here. See slowly rising temperature. This suggests that minus six-tenths of a degree below normal. And look what the trend is. Steadily hard upward as we get into mid-February. And from there, dead neutral by April. And there, heading up by uh, October, almost at 0.95 of a degree above uh, uh, normal. Clearly in El Nino territory, this model has been unwavering. This is the PDF corrected. Let's go look 
at the just the raw data, it suggests temperatures up at 1.15 or maybe even, yeah, about 1.15 degrees above normal in October and heading up from there. This would suggest strong La Nina conditions. Now, we're not going to buy into any of that hype now. It's way too early. We have months to go. But here's the case in point, or here's the evidence for some flavor of this happening. One Kelvin wave already crossed the Pacific. A second Kelvin wave is in flight right now, only a month behind. A third Kelvin wave is likely going to be in development over the next several weeks ahead. That would be three significant Kelvin waves over the coming future. And then with this model projecting more westerly anomalies, even though you don't necessarily have a cohesive Kelvin wave, westerly anomalies in and of themselves start pushing warm water off to the east, suggesting a machine of Kelvin waves and warm water flowing to the east, which is why this model is sensing steadily rising temperatures from here forward in the Pacific. As the temperatures rise, you'll get more evaporation across the Pacific. High pressure will quickly collapse. Whatever is left of the cold water in the equatorial Pacific will fade, and that will push us towards a warmer regime. And we believe there is lots of latent heat energy in the atmosphere. It's just not in the Pacific. It's been over the maritime continent for two years now. The pendulum is going to swing. The sea surface temperature anomaly forecast from PDF corrected data. Well, here we are today. I know the chart's kind of small here. Maybe we can blow it up. And you can see cold temperatures this is sort of our current pattern right now. And then we get into, I'll just go right to the end. Look at the buildup of warm water. This is in July. And if that isn't a full start to an El Nino cycle in July, and it's only going to get stronger from there, I don't know what would be. Now, again, it's a model going out six months. Do you believe all that? Well, take it with a grain of salt. But there is, be, there is significant evidence to suggest that a major atmospheric shift, if it isn't already happening, is poised to happen in the Pacific. And... We're on the leading edge of it here. We're looking at the early tea leaves. We're trying to divine the future by looking at tea leaves in the bottom of a teacup, <laughs> if, if you can believe that. But sort of, that is true. We're picking all these little shreds of evidence from all over the place, seemingly disparate things, and using knowledge that people way smarter than myself have been able to assemble, to get, assemble together, write books and papers and do PhD theses on, and all of it, and the government and and NOAA have been piling piles of money into being able to understand El Nino and La Nina because it has huge ramifications, not only in the United States in terms of your crops, the food you eat, the weather, uh, electricity distribution, but it affects the whole planet. Everybody needs to know about this. So we're on the bleeding edge here trying to go well. Yeah, how's this going to go? And how's this going to affect my surfing? But the reality is it affects a lot more than whether you get to go skiing or surfing. It might affect whether you have food to eat, uh, what your energy prices are going to be, how the markets are going to react. So uh, it's interesting to keep on top of all this. And then when you see stories in the mainstream press that are saying this or that or the other, you can balance it with what you're hearing here and say, does what uh, these videos are saying doesn't make sense, and are we on track? Yes, I could be wrong. Absolutely. I'm hoping I'm not, but it seems like we're headed definitely towards some form of El Nino in the pretty soon future, and that's good news. But in the shorter term, all right, looks like a better surf pattern setting up. Jet stream, going to get a little bit more invigorated. We're going to get some storms, small gales, a little bit of surf. Um, a little bit of high pressure, too. This is sort of the the last gasp of La Nina trying to do its thing before the door breaks open. We think somewhere around, like what we were saying before, February 19th, if not maybe even earlier, the beginning of the pendulum is going to start swinging in the other direction towards a lower pressure regime in the Pacific, uh, something more favorable for feeding the jet stream and feeding the storm track and feeding moisture coming into California. California. 
We're a little bit concerned about what might happen in late February and early March as the active phase of the MJO starts really pushing south of California. We'll keep our eyes on that. We're not going to make any pronouncements because that would be uh, irresponsible. But it seems like it's entirely possible we could have another uh, significant weather event here later in the month. All right, that's it for this week. If you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. Uh, any questions or concerns, write them down in the comments. We'll be happy to reply. And thank you for watching. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. It, all, it helps us and it helps the algorithm. And we'll do this again next week, same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.